Hijra means that a person, a man or a woman, that they move, that they travel uh, from a land of disbelief, Darul Kufr, land of disbelief, to a land of Islam. Very simple. For example, there's a man in America, the Sheikh says, and America is Dar Kufr. So he then becomes a Muslim. He becomes a Muslim and he is unable to proclaim his religion, to manifest his religion, right? To openly be a Muslim and to openly uh, act upon and abide by the symbols of Islam, the Shira'i, like the obligations and so on and so forth. So he's unable to uh, to manifest that and to proclaim that so then he travels he leaves uh, to a Muslim land right so this is this is hijrah this is the meaning of hijrah now the sheikh says based upon that hadith when a person makes hijrah then they vary there's different types of people who make hijrah so the first person the first type of person is the one who makes hijrah he leaves his land and he goes to allah and he goes to the messenger what does it mean to go to allah and to go to the messenger Ilallah, what does it actually mean it actually means to go to his sharia to go to his legislation to go to a place where there is where there is islam and the legislation which allah has legislated upon the tongue of his messenger sallam Right? And this is what this hadith is talking about. For hijratuhu illallahi wa rasulih. Meaning that whatever he attended, or whatever he intended, then he has achieved what he intended. He intended to emigrate to Allah's messenger, and so he achieved what he intended. Very clear. The second of those who are from the muhajireen who emigrate, is the one who, as the Sheikh says, Hajar Ali Dunya, Yusibuha, he emigrated for the world, some part of the world, in order to acquire it. Meaning, a man he goes and he, you know, he, is, he studies a Muslim land and he's looking, uh, it could be Egypt, it could be you know, Dubai, Emirates, could be any place, and he's looking for wealth, business, acquisition of wealth. It could even be employment or whatever it might be. And he looks, so he's looking for wealth. And he's heard that such and such uh, land of Islam, you know, it is very, uh, uh, the, the economy is good and uh, the environment is, is very good for earning uh, wealth. So he leaves the land of Kufr and he goes to the land of Islam just in order to make wealth, to gather wealth. And he didn't go because he wanted to be upright upon his religion, to have istiqama upon the religion. And he has no concern about the religion, but his concern is mal, wealth. The third type of person who makes emigration, as mentioned in the hadith, is a man who emigrates from the land of Kufr to a land of Islam, is because there is a woman that he desires to marry. And he will say, you know, he says, uh, maybe it's been said to him, look, we will not marry you to our daughter, to this woman, unless you come to our land. So then he leaves his land. What's his reason? Right? Is it because of, of Islam, the Sharia? The, you know, it's because he wants to marry this woman. So he leaves his land and he goes to the land of Islam because he wants to, you know, marry this woman. So what do we have? We have Muridul Dunya, the one who desires the world. We have Muridul Mar'a, the one who desires the woman. He didn't emigrate to Allah and his messenger. And so that's why at the end of the hadith, so notice, when the Messenger of the Sallam, when he mentioned, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Right? He said that, he said, the, the person who's emigrating to Allah's Messenger, then he confirmed and established that he achieved what he intended. Right? So he said, فَهِجْرَتُهُ but he did not do so for the other two. When he said, He didn't he didn't repeat and say again for you know to, to, to the dunya 
Yusibuha. Uh, he didn't say that. He didn't do the same thing which he said about the Hijra to Allah and his messenger. And the reason for that, two reasons are given. Some scholars say, well, it's because to avoid repetition, to avoid repeating the same speech again. But this isn't really, this is one of the explanations given. So he just simplified it and said, for Hijratuhu ila mahajira ilayh, instead of repeating the things again. However, um, the reason, the Sheikh says another explanation is that he did not repeat those two things, ihtiqaran lahuma wa i'radan an dhikrihima, falianahuma haqiran, right? He didn't repeat them in order to belittle them and to sideline them and to not give them any mention because they are lowly, they are lowly things. The world and a woman, you know, you emigrate for the world and for a woman, right? So why should it be mentioned again? It's, it's, it's lowly and despicable, so it will not be mentioned, right? Whereas the niyyah for the hijrah, this is from the greatest, noblest of actions. And because, uh, you know, uh, whereas intending a woman and wealth is like from the lowliest of, of actions. So they were not mentioned because they are corrupt intentions, they are lowly, and they, you know, they, 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 they uh, are not worthy of repetition. So these are the types of people. So what does this hadith contain? It contains, um, first of all, uh, the niyyah as a sabab in every action. What is the natija? Everybody will be rewarded for that which he intended. Intentions can be lofty. Intentions can be lowly. Intentions can be for the hereafter, they can be for the world. Then, there are the people who basically, uh, so, so this is a mizan, the intention, this hadith is a mizan for intention, which is inward, and the hadith of Aisha is a mizan for action, which is, which is outward. And then, the Sheikh went on to explain hijra, what is the definition of hijra? To abandon a land of kufr where you cannot proclaim and manifest your religion, to a land of Islam where you can. And you do so for that reason. Therefore, the emigrants are of three types. The one who emigrates to learn his messenger, the one who emigrates for, to the world for wealth, and the one who emigrates for a woman for, for marriage. So now the Sheikh goes on to mention, now what are the types of hijrah? Right? So we mentioned the types of emigrants. There are three. Now, what are the types of hijra? And the types of hijra, when we look at this, we see, as the Sheikh says, Al hijra takuno lil amal, takuno lil amal, wa takuno lil amil, wa takuno lil makan. So when we make hijra, there are three types of hijra. One is like an emigration as it relates to an action. Right? We emigrate away from an action. Another one is that we emigrate away from the doer of an action. The doer of an action, an amil. So meaning from people. We emigrate away from people. And the third is emigration from a place, a makan. So we leave a place. So these are the three types of hijra. You either leave a place, you emigrate from a place to something else. You either emigrate away from a person, away from a person who is doing a certain deed that warrants that you emigrate away from him, or you emigrate from deeds, from a deed, from, from an action. So the first of the three that the Sheikh is going to explain and discuss, Al Qismul Awal, Hijratul Makan. Right? This is the emigration from a place, which is a person leaves a place where there is lots of ma'asi, lots of sin, disobedience, lots of fusuq, disobedience, and perhaps it is a land of kufr. Right? So he leaves that land and he goes to a place where these affairs are not to be found. We do not find these sins, these disobedience, they're not there, they're not apparent, they're not present. So he leaves that place. And so the greatest of this is al hijra min baladil kufr ila baladil islam when a person leaves the land of kufr and goes to a land of islam and the reason why he said that, that the greatest form of this because there can also be hijra from a sinful place where there are sinful muslims 
So land of the Muslim place is sinful, there's ma'asi, there's other things. And then he leaves to go to a righteous place. Right? So this is hijrah too. But the greatest uh, hijrah is where it's from a land of kufr uh, to a land of Islam. And uh, this is when he is... So when is this? إِذَا كَانَ غَيْرَ قَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ إِذْهَارِ دِينِهِ So when he's unable to proclaim his religion, to make his religion manifest, to make it known and to practice. Right? Then the Sheikh says... Um, you know, it is obligatory upon him for him to emigrate. When you are unable to openly proclaim and practice your religion. And some of the, uh, the mashayikh of the da'wah uh, from the offspring of Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab, they explain what it means, you know, idhar, idhar din What does it mean? It means that you are able to openly proclaim your religion and also nullify and invalidate that which opposes it. That you make it clear, right? That this, this, this is shirk and this is kufr and this is atheism, this is ilhad and this is, this is uh, uh, disbelief and it's un unacceptable and that's the deen batil and uh, the deen of Islam is, is the haq, right? So this is what is meant by proclaim, openly proclaiming your religion, right? To, to, be, to make it known. And so you practice and you proclaim and you make it known. And so if, if you are uh, if you are unable to proclaim your religion in this way, then it is obligatory upon you to leave the land of Kufr to go to the land of Islam. So he says, as for when a person is actually able to proclaim his religion openly and manifest it and do the things like, like was said, practice your religion, call to the religion, uh, make distinction between that which is true religion, false religion, and uh, to make idhar of the deen. And he's not, um, you know, like the, when, when he establishes the sha'air, the openly, the symbols of Islam, and he's not opposed or, or harmed or, you know, whatever, then here the hijrah, is not obligatory, but it is, it is mustahab. It is recommended for him to make hijrah. So, on this basis, on the basis of what the shaykh has established so far, right, that from the land of kufr you must make hijrah, right, if you're unable to proclaim openly your religion, and if you're able to proclaim your religion, it is still mustahab for you to leave that place. Upon this, then the other way around, the Sheikh says, وَبِنَاءً عَلَى ذَلِكْ يَكُونُ السَّفَرْ إِلَى بَلَدِ الْكُفْرِ أَعْظَمَ مِنَ الْبَقَاءِ فِيهِ Now, the other way around, for you to go from a land of the Muslims to go to a land of the people of disbelief, that is even greater, that's greater than the one who is in the land of kufr and who remains in the land of kufr. That's, that's greater for a person to do that. And he says, as for when the land of Kufr is the actual home place, you know, the, the, the birthplace or the land of a person, and he's not able to establish his religion, then it is obligatory upon him to leave that place and to make hijrah from it. Right? So these are different scenarios. Likewise, when a person is from the people of Islam, from the lands of the Muslims, it is not permissible for him to travel to the lands of disbelief, why? Because this is a danger upon his religion and upon his morals, his manners. And likewise, it comprises a wastage of his wealth. And likewise, it also strengthens the economy of the people of disbelief. Look at all these different factors and reasons, right? It is a danger to his religion, a danger to his morals, a wastage of his wealth, and a strengthening of the, the economic strength of the people of disbelief. And however, we have been commanded, Yet we have commanded in the Quran to enrage, to enrage and to, you know, to uh, the people of disbelief with whatever we are able to do. The Sheikh mentions a number of ayat in the Quran. Ya 
قاتلوا الذين يلونكم من الكفار وليجدوا فيكم غلظة All you who believe So obviously this ayah is speaking in the context of uh, fighting which is prescribed upon the Sharia way and the Sharia manner. This is not uh, terrorism or extremism, extremism, whatever. It's within the, the, the confines of, of the Sharia in legitimate uh, warfare. Uh, fight those who are near to you from the people of disbelief and let them find in you ghilza, right? Like a, a sternness. And know that Allah is with the pious. And likewise, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَلَا يَتَعُونَ مَوْتِ أَنْ يَغِيذُ الْكُفَّارِ وَلَا يَنَالُونَ مِنْ عَدُوِّ النَّيْلَ إِلَّا كُتِبَ لَهُمْ بِهِ عَمَلٌ صَالِحٌ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That never do they, meaning the believers, tread on a ground, tread on a ground by which they enrage the, the people of disbelief and nor do they um, inflict upon the, them the enemy any affliction except that it is re- written for them as a righteous deed indeed Allah does not cause the reward of the muhsineen those who do good to be wasted so meaning that it is a desirable thing to uh, you know, uh, to to enrage or to frustrate uh, the people of disbelief, and this applies also economically, right? And so, to oppose that and therefore to strengthen them economically by by going and spending money and you know transferring the wealth and whatever, then the sheikh says, this is this this is not uh, not permissible, and so he says. فالكافر أيا كان سواء كان من النصارى أو من اليهود أو من الملحدين وسواء تسمى بالإسلام أم لم يتسمى بالإسلام الكافر عدو لله ولكتابه ولرسوله وللمؤمنين جميعا مهما تلبس بما يتلبس به فإنه عدو. So meaning that you know any person regardless of whether he's a Nasrani or a Yahudi or a Mulhid or if he pretends to you know uh, wear the gown of Islam <clears throat> such a person is always considered to be considered to be an adu right and so therefore it is not permissible for a person to travel to the lands of disbelief so we know now this is not permissible right so let's be clear what we've covered we're looking at hijra and uh, three types of hijra hijra of an amal hijra of an amil hijra of makan place we're looking at makan in this one Hijr of Makan is leaving a land of disbelief to a land of Islam. Right? That is, if you are unable to proclaim your religion, it is wajib. Right? And if you are born in that land and it's your homeland and you are unable to practice religion, it's wajib for you to, to leave. Otherwise, it is mustahab. However, the reverse, for you to come from a land of Muslims and Islam and to go to a land of disbelief, that is not permissible. It is not permissible. And the Sheikh gave reasons for that, right? Danger to your religion, danger to your morals, uh, wastage of wealth, and it is strengthening the people of disbelief economically. And however, that does not mean that it is absolutely forbidden in all circumstances to travel to the lands of disbelief because there are certain circumstances in which a person may need to be required to, to travel to the lands of disbelief. And so the Sheikh now is going to explain a number of conditions. There are three conditions. There must be one of three conditions to allow you to travel from a land of the Muslims to a land of the people of disbelief. What are those three conditions? First of all, the Sheikh says, "Ashartul awwal, fala yajuzu lil insan an yusafira ila balad al kufr illa bi shurutin thalatha." A Muslim is not allowed to travel to the lands of disbelief except with one of three conditions. The first one, ashartul awwal, an yakuna indahu ilmun yadfa'u bihi shubuhat li anna al-kuffar yuriduna ala al-muslimin shubuhan fi dinihim wa shubuhan fi rasulihim wa shubuhan fi kitabihim wa shubuhan fi ikhlaqihim to the end. First of all, that he has knowledge by which he can repel the doubts. Because the people of disbelief, they have doubts as we know. They, they spread doubts upon the Muslims in their religion regarding their messenger, 
so many lies they tell about the Messenger of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They have uh, lies about the book, the Quran. They have lies about the manners and morals of the Muslims making it out to be you know, evil, nasty people. And so they bring every type of doubt about the Sharia, about women, about this, about that. And so why do they do this? It's to make a person to have doubt, to have, to, to have shak in his religion. And we are commanded to have yaqeen, certainty in our religion. When a person, you know, when he, when he has doubt, then he hasn't um, fulfilled the obligation. The obligation in our religion is to have yaqeen, to have certainty in all of the affairs, in belief in Allah, in the angels, in the books, in the messengers, the last day, al-qadr, the good and the evil, in all things of the religion. But if a person starts now having shak, having doubt in any of these affairs, shak itself is kufr, it is disbelief. It is disbelief. And why do the people of disbelief, why is it that they choose shak over trying to convert you? Do you understand? There's one thing, try to convert you, to make you a Muslim. But there's another thing, trying to cause doubt in your religion. They find it easier to cause doubts rather than to actually convert the people. And that's why some of them, as the Sheikh says, some of their leaders, they, they, some of their callers, their leaders, they say, do not try to make a Muslim leave his religion. Right? لا تحاولوا أن تخرجوا المسلم من دينه إلى دين النصارى ولكن يكفي أن تشككوه في دينه. Right? Do not try to take a Muslim out of his religion to the religion of the Christians, but just it's sufficient for you to make him have doubt in his religion. Because if you make him have doubts about his religion, then you've stripped him of his own religion anyway. And this is sufficient, right? So you take him out of this, you know, where he has this like strength and honor and uh, nobility and so on and so forth. Take him out of that situation and that position by making him have a doubt in his religion. And that should be sufficient. But as for you trying to convert him and you know uh, whatever then this is this is not the best method so this is what we see as the sheikh said uh, shukuk about uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about uh, his religion about his sharia about his messenger about the unseen and then this these doubts come in so many different ways from them is from the angle of of culture culture from them is from the angle of uh, science and speculative uh, theories and ideas your Quran is backward you know we've established uh, you know uh, the cosmology of the universe and your Quran says something else or you know all, all these different ways they, they, they get to people by way of science making it look as if the scientific theories are established verified facts when they're not they are conjectures right this is a, a route that they come from all sorts of different routes culture um, entertainment you know sports even Right? This, is how they, this is how they do it in the West. They use uh, talented people, whether it's in academia, whether it's in uh, sports, whether it's in entertainment, right? to which the hearts of the youth become attached. And then they infuse ideologies and you know, uh, behavioral you know, things through, through these individuals in order to misguide the people in, in their religion. There are so many different ways that they, that they basically use. So we shouldn't think, oh, well, you know, no one's trying to convert us, you know, to become a Yahudi or a Mulhid or a, or a Nasrani or a Buddhist. So we've got nothing to worry about. So it's not working like that. Right? It's, they want to create the shak, the doubt about Islam and then specifically about the manhaj, the aqidah of the salaf specifically. And then they also prop up. So they, they were the ones who will prop up, for example, uh, the mutakallimin and the falasifa. Right? So when you look at all the uh, Orientalists, the, the Orientalists, right, the ones who study Islam, its history, the Quran, the Sunnah, whatever, and to cause doubts, then they will, they will always try to promote uh, the Rafida, the Qadianis, right, the Ash'aris, the Mu'tazila. This is the, the, rational, the rational type of Islam that should be, because they know, right? They know that this, this, this is just Greek philosophy, which, which is their heritage, that's not ours. It's their heritage that came to the Muslims as a result of which the, this ilmul kalam is not our heritage. So they prop up these types of movements. They love Sufism. 
They love Sufism. Why? Because Sufism is simply uh, unity of existence, which is unity of religions. And unity of existence is a pure atheism. And it's also unity of religions. All religions are the same. They all lead to the same, you know. Right? So this is vast what they do, and it's all to create uh, shukuk, doubts in the hearts and minds of the Muslims. And so therefore, the condition is for you to go to a land of the kuffar, it has to be, if you've got knowledge, if you have ilm, if you, if you, if you, have, you have knowledge of the religion and you have knowledge of their doubts and you, you are deeply rooted in that, then you can go and to serve the cause of Islam and to aid the Muslims in their religion and to protect them from, from being misled, then this is one of the one of the conditions. And so this, the second condition the Sheikh mentions is that he must also have religiosity. He must have religion, meaning he must be righteous, which will protect him from the desires. So you must be a person who is righteous, pious, who will fear the evil, who is able to protect himself and avoid and not be tempted. Because this now is shahawat. The first one is shubuhat. You have ilm, you have knowledge. You will not be tempted by the shubuhat. You will not fall, fall prey to the doubts because you are going there to refute the doubts because you are deeply rooted in knowledge and in, in understanding of their doubts. But just because you have knowledge does not mean that you are a righteous, pious person. Because a person can be given intelligence and knowledge Zuka, uh, but he may not be given purity and righteousness, zakah, right? So a second condition is that he must have a solid religion. There must be sulb, there must be some backbone in his religion, right? For him not to be tempted by the shahawat, because a man, you know, um, he may be, able to, may, be, may be able to repel the doubts, but if he doesn't have religion, and taqwa and piety and a backbone in his religion and he knows that he will not fall prey to temptations like that then you know then you know if, if, if there's not this condition then maybe he will drown in because in the lands in these lands it is just all the flowery aspects of the world it is shahawat which you can access and enjoy unlimited you know khamar zina liwat all types of evils which are present, um, all types of, you know, every crime is present in the lands of the people of, of uh, disbelief. So if he goes to these places, then it is feared that, you know, he will slip, he will stumble, and, you know, unless he has religion that will protect him, so therefore a person must have deen. He must have, like, he must be a righteous person who travels to the land of the people of disbelief. Now this is a second condition, and the third condition uh, for for leaving, uh, to going, to traveling to the land of the people of disbelief, is that there must be a need to do so. There has to be a need to do so. For example, he's ill, and he needs to travel because the treatment he can only gain in the lands of the people of disbelief. Um, or he might need a special type of knowledge. There's a specialism that is taught only in some of the lands of the people of disbelief. Um, so he wants to acquire that knowledge and obviously for the benefit of the Muslims. So he goes there, he learns that knowledge, right? Or he's in need of doing trade because trading across borders, you know, it's, it's obviously it's permissible. And he knows and, and he goes to do trade and um, goes and comes back. Okay, so there has to be a need. There has to be a need to do so. For this reason, the Sheikh says, and this is important, he considers that simply traveling to the land of disbelief only for the sake of siyaha, tourism, sightseeing, to see this place and that place. He says, such people, I consider them, ara annahum athimun. I consider them to be sinful. They are sinful people. And that every money, every pound or every, you know, what they spend, which, which they spend upon this journey, then it is haram upon them. It's actually haram, the Sheikh says. And it is a wastage of their wealth and they will be held to account for it on the day of judgment. The day when they will not find any, any room or space or to be able to absolve themselves. You know, they will only find their own actions. Why? Because the Sheikh says these people are wasting their time. 
they are destroying their wealth they are corrupting their morals their, 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 their manners and perhaps they even take the whole families with them as well the, you know the women the daughters the you know the sons whatever young and they take them and uh, the sheikhs it's strange that they go to these places where you don't hear any adhan you don't hear, have, hear any dhikr but what do you hear instead you hear the trumpet of the yahud or you hear the bells the church bells of the nasara of the christians that's what you hear and then they stay there for a, for a, for a while um, with their families with the children they go for maybe weeks or months on end and so a great amount of evil you know occurs as a result of this and what the sheikh mentioned is we, we see it we see it directly with our own eyes uh, people leaving the gulf countries and they come and establish and they settle themselves here um, some of them we see even become the, the, the christians you know take on christian names you know we, we see people uh, we know of people you know uh, uh, changing their names like we know people from the gulf countries come and they, they take residence in, in our, our towns and cities and you know they, they used to be known as Amal or you know, whatever it might be and now they, it's, it's you know it's um, Katie and something else they change the names of the, the, the kids as well to, to Christian sounding names you know Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illa Allah. So this is what the Shaykh has described, Rahimahullah. After mentioning all of this, he then says that this is from the great trials. The fact that we see Muslims traveling to the land of the non-Muslims, uh, putting themselves in danger, uh, in, in the deen, in their morals, spending of their wealth and strengthening the economies of, of, of you know, uh, those same nations that then use that wealth to create subterfuge and to wage war against uh, you know, uh, lands uh, occupied by you know Muslims. Um, the Sheikh says this is from the this is from the calamity. This is from the calamities by which Allah He brings afflictions and calamities upon the upon the Muslims. And the Sheikh says that these calamities that we see that we that we observe and witness that we live in uh, now. The reason for them is these very types of sins and disobedience. As Allah said in the Quran, Whatever afflicts you of any calamity, then it is because of what your hands have earned. And yet he pardons many. The Shaykh says we are heedless. You know, we are, we are safe in our own countries. And it is if our Lord like we act as if our Lord is, is, doesn't, doesn't know about us and he doesn't know and he's heedless and as if Allah doesn't give room and rope to the oppressor before he takes him in punishment right in other words 
we behave and act as if that you know we 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 do all these things and we are heedless and we think Allah is not mindful of us but Allah from his from his sunan is that when there are people who do oppression he will allow them to keep doing their oppression he will give them like like a rope and they'll continue and continue and continue and continue and continue right and then all of a sudden in a certain all of a sudden the punishment will come and you know no one will be able to take it back and so the sheikh says this is how people's hearts they become hard Allah is talking about some people that even those whom he afflicted with punishment they still did not become humble and still did not become submissive what the sheikh is saying here is that we took the Allah Allah says we took them with punishment and the punishment came to them and despite the punishment coming to them still their hearts are hard they do not humble and call upon Allah in repentance and they didn't you know fear his what is, what, what is this is the hardness of the heart once the heart becomes hardened even punishment from Allah is not going to be is not going to you know change that and so the reason why the Shaykh is saying that is just look at the condition of the Muslims today that even with all of the punishments that we see befalling this Muslim nation what punishments do we see we see poverty we see hunger we see war we see occupation we see genocide right which is wiping wiping out whole you know a nation or group of people that we see the Yahud are doing right all of these calamities we see we see every type of calamity and yet still the hearts have become so hard that they don't turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so this is the this is the danger of this happening and one of the factors of this happening is when people leave the lands of the Muslims then they go and take residence in the lands of the kuffar or they go there and they put a trial in the religion they pick up all of these calamities right they come back they go and then they come back and the kids come back and they are all you know infatuated with with the celebrities and the pop stars and the singers and the sports personalities and this and whatever and the whole mindset has changed and they become corrupted in the deen and in the morals right this is what brings calamities upon the Muslim nation it hardens the heart it makes the heart to be cold uh, as the Sheikh says and we seek refuge in Allah from the death of the heart right so then finally if we just bear with me just a few more minutes inshallah we'll finish the the final uh, section inshallah so the third so the, in conclusion traveling to the lands of the kuffar for da'wah is permissible is permissible you know when it's going to have an effect and in that case is permissible because it, it's a travel for a maslaha and you know uh, the sheikh says that many many of the people in the land of disbelief the common people they've been blinded you know by the lies about Islam they don't know what Islam is and you know therefore there is a maslaha in da'wah to go there and to do away with all these doubts that they have that Islam is a barbaric religion Islam is a backward religion Islam is a you know which is what they've heard and what they understand so therefore there is a maslaha in da'wah but if you are going to go um, then these are the you know these are the other conditions as, as the Sheikh mentioned uh, you have to have knowledge you have to have Deen and there must be a need for doing so right uh, among them is that one other things are trade uh, treatments for sickness you know there are, there are other things uh, maybe you have parents or something you want to go there give them the rights maybe give that that one to them if they're non-muslim whatever so this now is the second uh, this uh, the first one hijratul makan the second is hijratul amal hijratul amal so this now is when you emigrate away from an action meaning you leave and abandon an action and this is the raman an yahjurul insan an yahjurul insan ma nahawullah anhu min al maasi wal fusuq this is when a man abandons what Allah has prohibited upon him of sins and disobedience 
as the messenger of Allah said al muslimu man salim al muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi wal muhajiru man hajara ma nahallahu anhu the muslim is the one from whom other muslims are safe from his tongue and from his hand and the muhajir the emigrant is the one who emigrates away from what allah has prohibited from prohibited him from so therefore the shaykh says you make hijra from everything which allah has made haram whether it is in relation to the rights of allah the rights of allah or whether it is in relation to the rights of the servants of allah so therefore you make hijra you abandon you emigrate away from reviling cursing abusing killing being deceptive acquiring the wealth of people in falsehood meaning cheating and embezzling people in their wealth cutting off the ties of the, the with the parents cutting off the ties of the relatives everything that allah has made haram you emigrate away from it from the sins from alcohol from fornication from gambling from lying from cheating from stealing from everything allah made haram then you make hijra from that right so this is hijra min al amal hijra from, from 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 the you know from the uh, from the action or hijratul amal the third one the third and final one is hijratul amil hijratul amil now you're making hijra from the person who is doing certain deeds so you emigrate away from him you leave him you abandon him you're not in his company and so this is the person the sheikh says um, uh, uh, a person who openly displays his disobedience he commits disobedience in the open he doesn't care about anything has no shame and uh, this person has to be abandoned so you you emigrate away from his uh, company and this is to punish him and to make him realize that he's sinful and he needs to uh, repent and to know the level of his sin self and he needs to, need to turn back from uh, sinfulness and disobedience so for example the shakers a man is known with deception in buying and selling he's not honest he's not trustworthy he can't be trusted so he deceives people in trade so the people abandon him they don't give him salam they don't visit him they don't uh, talk to him they abandon him for a period of time until he repents and he's remorseful this is permissible to do so another person we know he's dealing with riba dealing with riba and so you know we we make hijrah from him do, do not give him salam do not speak to him and uh, when he realizes that the people are treating him like this maybe he will abandon that sin and maybe a third person from among the muslims are those who do not who abandon the prayer completely they don't pray at all no prayer at all time for prayer comes and you sit them in the in the houses you getting up to pray maghrib and the, 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 these are muslims they don't stand they don't make wudu they don't join you in the prayer right when you have like gatherings of relatives and this is this is you know uh, they need to be um, you know admonished and and you know such a person in the view of the sheikh because many scholars hold the view that someone who does not pray at all he is a murtad he cannot be a muslim this is the view of many scholars that the tariq of salah is a murtad he's an apostate because he's, he doesn't establish any prayer at all how can he not pray when he said the shahada i bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except allah and then you do not worship this is a contradiction right so these are some examples the sheikh has given of when we can make hijrah from a person um you know when when there is benefit in that as for when there is when there is no benefit maybe there will not be benefit um then you know uh, you know so when a person when, when it's on the basis of kufr obviously then we abandon without any clarification or any tafsil right but when it's sin and disobedience then we do so when there is a maslaha and a benefit to be obtained from doing that and uh, then the sheikh goes on to uh, elaborate upon this point a little bit he gives the example of some of the companions in the ghazwa of tabuk there were three companions who didn't go to the battle they they withheld and what happened is the Muslims boycotted them, never spoke. This is Ka'b bin Malik radiallahu anhu and those with him. And the Muslims did not speak to them for many uh, weeks, a number of uh, long weeks on end. Um, and the Muslims commanded 
the people not to give them salam, not to, uh, to speak to them, not to anything. And eventually this led them, you know, they were, they were faithful, they made tawbah to Allah, they repented, they turned back to Allah. And then eventually Allah accepted their repentance. And so this is an example of where you can boycott somebody where there is a maslaha in their boycott and a benefit in their boycott. So anyhow, we conclude with that. Uh, this is the end of our discussion of the hadith. Right? We mentioned many, many masail in this, in this hadith. We looked at the niyyah. What is the niyyah? Where is the niyyah? Where does it take place? Uh, we looked at the hadith itself. Uh, you know, uh, the very sentences. We looked at the issue of hijra, the meaning of hijra, the types of hijra, the types of emigrants, and the conditions for traveling to a land of the people of disbelief. Right? They're very, very clear, simple issues. So alhamdulillah, we understand this hadith. With that, we'll conclude our lesson there for today. And shall we continue with the next hadith in this chapter, next, next time that we meet. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.